My name is Ian Livingston. I'm from Ubisoft Montreal. I'm going to talk to you today about a method. Uh, this is my fancy title for what we call the review analysis. And we've been doing it for a little while at Ubisoft. So first of all, who am I? Um, I've been doing user research since about 2008. Um, I started at an indie company in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, that's part of Canada. Uh, and I worked on a game called Capsized. Uh, since 2011, I've actually been in Montreal, where I've been working on the Far Cry brand. So I've had the opportunity to work on Far Cry 3, Blood Dragon, and Far Cry 4. So today, I'm going to do two parts of this talk. First, I'm going to tell you why um, we should be studying video game reviews and why we as user researchers are well positioned to be the ones who are doing that study. And then I'm going to tell you how at Ubisoft we've gone about developing this method to, to do this research. So first, the why. OK, so why is there a need to study? Um, essentially, when you consider uh, who video game reviewers are, um, these guys are, in essence, highly articulate, highly experienced, uh, well-informed, and well-plugged-in players. Um, the, the reviews that they produce and the, the, any articles that they write are actually very rich sources of data for us as researchers uh, and also for production teams. Uh, the second thing, the second reason why we need to study it is the reviews for a game are actually the first uh, portal, first view into how the game is going to be um, viewed in the, larger, in the larger discourse that surrounds a game at launch. Um, the third reason, and probably the most important reason, is that teams are already doing, they're already looking at reviews, they're already writing their own reports, they're collecting data, they're looking for things that confirm their, their biases. Uh, and one of the main issues here is that this is not really an objective analysis, and we want to try and avoid that, that issue as much as possible. So why is there a need for us as user researchers to be the ones who are doing this analysis? The, the primary reason, this ties back to the reason why there's a need, is that we're trained researchers, right? We understand rigor, we understand process, we can be objective, and we can ensure that there's, there's a systematic way that we go about doing this analysis in the, in the long run. The second reason is that we are, in fact, more objective, okay? Uh, for the most part, we're able to remove ourselves from the, the, the closeness that the production teams have uh, to, their, to their work, to their craft, and we can do a much more objective analysis. We can remove ourselves and have a higher level view of the issues that's, that are coming out in, in, the, in the reviews. The third reason is that we're able to then contextualize that, those results within the larger research effort that has existed. Right? So at Ubisoft, we're constantly doing uh, user studies throughout the the, the, the production cycle, pre-production, uh, and into post-launch. And because we're doing this kind of analysis, uh, when we go about doing these, these review analyses, we're a actually able to put it in the context of the, the larger uh, understanding that we've been building up around a game. Right? So uh, this analysis that I'm presenting today is actually only one part of the, the larger post-launch effort that we have. So we do analytics um, analysis, we do a post-mortem, and all of this, and really, there's a there's a huge thing that uh, a huge effort that we do after the game's launched to really understand how uh, the game is being played, consumed, and talked about. Okay, so the how. So first of all, I want to tell you that this is something that we've been iterating on for quite a long time. Okay, so we've been using this process since Far Cry 3, and since then, we've actually had the opportunity to run this this process and iterate on it and change it over time. Uh, all the way up to our most recent titles, so Far Cry 4 and Assassin's Creed Unity. And what I'm going to show you is really the, the current state of, of how we do this process, okay? Um, yeah. So the high-level objective that we have is basically to take this raw review that we find online and turn it into a report that is actually very easy for our, um, our production teams to consume and understand. So. I'm going to jump straight into how we go about doing it. But before I go into the actual process, I just want to give you kind of a definition of what it is. So the review analysis is a grounded theory analysis of reviews. It organizes the breadth of ideas that are presented within those reviews into a stable theoretical framework, which addresses the high-level questions that are asked by the, by the production teams. So I've highlighted two terms there that I think, I'm, well, I think, I think are worth uh, discussing briefly before we go too far. 
just so that we're all on the same page. I don't want to assume that everybody um, has a background in, in grounded theory and understands how to do this, but I know that we, are, we all spend our time uh, doing certain amounts of, of coding of, of qualitative player data. But for those of you who, who, who haven't had the opportunity to work with this before, grounded theory is a, is a qualitative method where you take a rich data source, such as, such as reviews, and you break it down into its core parts, its core ideas, and you then, uh, through your analysis, you build up uh, an overall understanding of what the, what the reviews are saying, how they're saying it, and how they're, how they're addressing these questions of interest. And as you're doing your analysis, you're building up a theoretical framework over time. So your theoretical framework is actually formed from your analysis as you're going through. So, Let's talk about that process in a little more detail. There's, there's four primary steps. The first one is the planning, the data collection, where we're taking that data from, the analysis, and then finally the reporting. And I'm going to go into each one of these steps in detail, uh, which hopefully will illustrate how we go about doing this. So uh, planning at Ubisoft. Now, I'm going to, everything that I'm going to tell you is, today is in the context of how we do it at, at Ubisoft. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about how I feel that this can be scaled down. But for now, let's just focus on, on how we've been doing it. Um, the first thing that is, that is really important is that at Ubisoft, we, tend to, we try to use between two and six uh, researchers to do this analysis. And there's a number of reasons why we go about doing this. Um, but it really comes down to ensuring that we have rigor process and we're able to review each other's work and ensure that we're developing a very stable, uh, complete theoretical understanding of what the reviews are saying. The second thing that we do is we set how long we're going to give ourselves to do this analysis. Um, we tend to try and uh, deliver our report within two to four weeks, but it's really dependent on the depth of analysis, the questions that are being asked, and also the number of researchers that are available to conduct the analysis. Right? Uh, the more people we have available, the faster we're able to deliver the, the analysis. Uh, the last thing that we have to do when we're planning is figuring out precisely how, what we're going to ask and how we're going to answer it. Um, and in this, in this case, what we do is we have two primary questions and between six and eight focus questions. The focus questions help guide our analysis uh, and ensure that we're actually addressing things that are of interest to the, the teams that we're, we're working with. So here's an example from Far Cry 4. This is just a slide uh, from the presentation that I, I would have given to the team then. Um, and what you see here is just uh, the, the two high-level questions that we have, and this is actually pretty universal across the board for all of our, all of our games. We ask these two, these two high-level questions. What influenced the, the reviews in a positive and negative way for that game? And how was the game described um, overall? The second layer of that is, is the questions of interest that, are, are, that the, the teams put forward. Um, what you see here is that we have six questions. Um, and they take the form of how and what questions, right? So when you're doing this qualitative work, uh, you're really looking at questions that are how, what, and why, right? You're trying to ask, answer these, these broad, generalized questions uh, through your theoretical framework. Now you'll see that there's no why specifically uh, put here, but that's because the why is implicit in the how and what questions, right? So how was Far Cry 4 described in the review publications, and why was it described that way? It's, it's implicit. Okay, data collection. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that we, you know, we're obviously collecting a number of reviews here. So at Ubisoft, we look at um, we look at thirty reviews. Ten minutes? Serious? Okay, we look at thirty reviews and we collect them. We start from a review aggra aggrava aggravation. Yeah, I'm aggravated. We t we take them from a review aggregation website. Um, so this is, for example, you, you guys all know Metacritic or, or Game Ranking. The purpose of taking it from here is one, we need the reviews to be online so that we can find the review text. And two, uh, we, like, we need to have a, a nice collection of reviews so that we can figure out um, what's, what's that general order between uh, those that were, were given high ratings and those were given low ratings. We take those reviews from the, the top, the middle, and bottom. Um, because we need to have uh, a breadth, right? We're not just looking at the, the good reviews or just the bad reviews. We want to understand how the game is being re received overall. Uh, the other condition is the review obviously has to be online so that we can actually take that, that data uh, and do our analysis. Okay, analysis in nine minutes. Coding. 
So the way that we go about our coding is we use Word. Uh, in essence, we take the raw review that's available online, we put it in Word, and then we use the commenting system that's available in Word to do our coding. Um, we use two types of coding. The first one is open coding. Um, and if you've, if you've done coding before, then this is probably the one you're most familiar with. Um, and this is where you don't restrict yourself to the type of uh, code that you can apply to an idea that you find within the, the, the document. Um, in this respect, the only thing you're using is your, your focus questions to guide the direction that you're, you're looking for. So you're looking for things like gameplay or, or, or visual appeal, these kind of things. The other thing that we do, and this is the case across the board, is every code is assigned either a positive, negative, or neutral um, label. Uh, these codes, these, these positive, negative, neutral codes allow us to, when we get to our frequency analysis, they allow us to uh, figure out how the, the comment was, was, was perceived by the, by the reviews. There's a degree of subjectivity here, but in general, if something is clearly positive, it's labeled positive. Clearly negative, it's labeled negative, and if it's if it's unclear, we, we label it neutral. Second thing we do is the the selective coding. So this is usually done in the middle, towards the end um, of the coding that we're doing across all the different reviews. Um, when we get to this point, when we're starting to do a selective coding type of analysis, uh, we are starting to limit the the things that that are being coded to the things that are have shown to be of interest and are important to the overall framework, right? So if we've started to see various themes come out, then we will start restricting our, our analysis to those themes so that we can actually sort of speed up the overall process and ensure that we're getting a, a, a breadth of understanding on those, on those topics. Memoing is the second part of the process. Um, what you see here is two different uh, researchers, uh, the memos of two different researchers to the same question on different reviews. And I'd like to draw your attention to these two lines. Uh, these were done separately, but what we see here is when we start doing the memoing, and the memoing is really a summary of the, the analysis that was done per review, uh, that tells us the, it's, it's the start of the, the theoretical framework that we're developing. So each, re each researcher is going to start building out uh, a theory of how how the reviews are discussing specific topics and sp specific questions. But what I've highlighted here is that uh, we start to see these, these topics become uh, apparent. Start, things are becoming obvious, uh, and there's, there's some agreement between these, these two, two researchers already. So in the first case, uh, we have um, adventure and exploration, and in the next one, uh, exploration of the world and incentivizing. So we can see that there's, there's the idea that the open world is being described through uh, the ability to explore this space and the sense of adventure that is being instilled and that there is a, an incentive to explore this space. So we can see that there's, there's starting to be some, some theory that uh, is coming out here. The next part uh, that is very important is this peer debriefing. Um, the way that we go about doing this, we actually do this constantly throughout the, the process. We do this constantly throughout the process. We, um, we will meet at approximately 25% of the reviews that we've, we've analyzed, 50%, 75%, and obviously at the, at the end. And what we do is we will take all of the codes that, that we've been using, especially at the beginning, and we'll ensure that we're, we're using the same coding practice, the same terminology to highlight similar ideas. Um, and this is important when we start building out the, the overall theoretical framework for the analysis. That it's important that we are using the same terms and we're, we're looking for the, for the same ideas and uh, so that when we get to the point where we need to sort them, which also happens in the, in the debrief session, that we're able to start placing these into conceptual categories that we can start building a, a larger theoretical framework. The last thing that is done during these sessions or, or just after is we codify what you see in the, in the sorting section into a code document. And this is then used by every, all the researchers who are working on the analysis in order to continue their, their, iterative, um, their iterative process as they uh, code and analyze additional reviews. Possibly the most important aspect of what we do is we do something called negative case analysis. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. After we've gone through the, the first round of memoing and the, sorry, the first round of coding and memoing and uh, debriefs and, and peer debriefs, 
Uh, when we go back and we start coding additional reviews, what we try and do is uh, look for cases that contradict our current understanding of that, that theoretical framework. Um, I'm not going to give you an example because I don't have time, but ask me after I've got some good examples. Okay. The theory development, as I've kind of mentioned, is actually happening at all times during this during this analysis, right? It really begins at the first review. Each review researcher is going to be doing their own their own theory development as they go. They record that that uh, that theory in the memo. They articulate it the first time there. During the debriefs, we're actually sharing that to ensure that we have we're starting to build out a, a breadth um, theory. And then when we go back and we do additional coding and additional memoing, we're challenging it through the negative case analysis, right? Uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned up until this point is that we actually have one lead researcher who's leading that, that entire effort. His responsibility at this point is to actually start writing this up and put it in a, in a form that is easy for people to consume, um, but also fully articulates the, the overall analysis that's been done. The way that we go about doing this is this three parts, right? So this is this would happen after the during and after the, the, the peer debrief. The memo is, is shared and discussed. Uh, those are categorized. Different, different researchers have different ways of, of doing this. My preference, I do this straight, I take straight notes when I do this, so we'll be discussing the memos. While we're, while we're discussing it, I'm building, um, just in my notebook, uh, the categories, and then I take that back and I build out the overall theory document. And this is a living document that is constantly being built out and changed as we move forward. Okay, the last step of the, the analysis is something, is, is the frequency analysis. Now, in my opinion, uh, from, from my position, I feel this is, this is actually both the least and the most important uh, part of the overall analysis. Um, some people might disagree with me, but from my position, when it comes to, to doing a grounded theory study, the numbers are actually generally irrelevant for the overall theory development. We're not interested in and specifically how frequently a topic comes up, we're interested in ensuring that we have a breadth, right? We want to make sure that we understand all the different um, angles of a topic so that we can have uh, a, a complete understanding. However, numbers are actually very important because for those who aren't familiar with qualitative work, it's actually very illustrative. I see. I see, one minute, okay. Uh, it's very illustrative for people when, when you're going about um, presenting this work in a way that's, that people need to believe and consume this, this information uh, in a way that's, uh, that is easy. Okay. With one minute left, I'm going to go quick. Hey, Lenny. Uh, right. Reporting. There's one key thing to take away from the slide, and that's when you're presenting the results. Uh, it's very important that you present it directly to your key stakeholders. This is because the theory that you developed is very complex. It's always going to be very deep, um, and simply throwing a report out, you know, building up a, a document and reporting it, uh, there's going to be nuances that are lost. So you have to take the time to present your results in a way that your, your primary stakeholders are going to be able to consume this, understand the complexity that you're delivering, and then report it back to their, their teams in a way that's, that's clear and correct. So I have one example real quick. See these things? This would be a raw um, theory document. Um, I'm highlighting some things that exist in the, uh, the overall report. This is how we would present it to the team. So the first thing that we do is we always present the, the, the general simple theory on the, on the left, and we highlight it with the qualitative data. We'll highlight the different points as we move forward. But you'll see there's no numbers on the slide. Um, as if I was presenting this to a production team, I wouldn't talk about the numbers at all until after I presented the full theory that's, that's, uh, that, I, that we have. Uh, in this case, the comparisons are there to illustrate uh, a very simple point. After we've done that, uh, we would then show the, the frequency analysis. In this case, the numbers are there to highlight just how infrequently other games were compared to Far Cry 4. So scaling, I know I'm out of time, right? You're going to kick me off? Yeah. OK. Uh, but this is the interesting thing for everybody who is in Ubisoft. So basically, if you want to scale this down, it, there's, there's two ways that you can do it super easily. Okay. First of all, look at fewer reviews. Okay. Um, 
we look at 30, you can look at less. Uh, you can, the best way of doing this is that when you're doing your analysis, you wanna, you wanna continue your analysis until you reach something called saturation. I'm not gonna talk about it, ask me about it later. The other thing you can do is ask fewer focus questions. You can ask fewer focus questions. I said we do between six and eight, but you can literally ask one focus question. If you are interested in how reviewers talked about your narrative, then you could only ask the question, how is my narrative described? How is it described in a positive and negative way? Uh, and by doing that, you instantly reduce the amount of coding you need to do, and you instantly reduce the amount of memoing that you need to do in the overall analysis. So it decreases the work exponentially. Okay, so in conclusion, I very briefly and quickly showed you how to, <laughs> how to do uh, this process that, that we do at uh, Ubisoft Montreal. Uh, and hopefully I've convinced you why it's important for us at, um, as user researchers to be the ones who are doing this analysis and why there's a need to do this in an objective and rigorous manner. Thank you.